Okay, welcome to everyone. Um, this is the, the inaugural um, webinar from AAD. Um, we are hoping to be able to bring uh, many more webinars in the future. Um, not to involve, but we just want to really, I guess, touch on practical um, parts of veterinary dentistry that uh, we all face. Um, we are looking at um, certainly taking in a lot of um, direction from uh, you guys uh, as um, the people on the ground actually doing this work. So if you've got um, uh, anything to say about it, any suggestions, certainly let us know. Uh, we first thought we've seen, um, I think an increase in this kind of problem. Do you think we have back? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so what, uh, what I was gonna say is, uh, yeah, we, I think we are seeing a few more of, of these um, base narrow dogs um, coming through. Uh, and I think it's a bit of a combination of uh, everyone being more aware of the problem, uh, keeping an eye out for it and actually looking for it. Uh, but also I think this is a side effect of us starting to mix around the diverse genetics amongst our small dogs uh, and getting our oodle crosses. Yeah, lots of oodles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is going to be the first in a, a series uh, about base narrow canines, and we just want to run through it um, in, the, in the fashion that we see it. We see it as, as young puppies, and we'll work our way through over the next few webinars, uh, all the way through to um, the quite definitive treatments um, and issues that we, we do uh, a little later on. Uh, yeah, I've just been... A good point has been pointed out to me. Introduce yourself, Introduce Aaron. Yourself. <laughs> I've got such a big head. I think everyone knows who I am. It's, it's on the oops, wrong side. It's on the thing above me. <laughs> so my name's uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron Forsyth. Um, I've been a veterinary dentist now uh, for 16 years. Uh, I love dentistry and I love talking. So it's a good combo for tonight. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, a long time ago now, um, I started this company with Dr. Gary Wilson, um, but I was lucky enough um, a few years ago now um, that uh, Dr. Beck Tucker came lucky on. Lucky or not, we'll see. Well, lucky from my <laughs> um came on board and, and is now my, my business partner uh, with AD. Um, do you want to tell people about yourself, Beck? Oh, I guess so. Um, so I guess I spent my first number of years in general practice, um, mainly smallies, um, moved to Brisbane in 2012. Um, I guess following the dentistry sort of side of things, I'd already done my memberships at that point. Um, I started a residency through the American um, Veterinary Dental College in 2013 um, with my primary supervisor over in Canada. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a job uh, with Aaron and Gary and I completed my residency through them. Um, sat my exams prior to COVID and I've got one to go, which who knows when that will be, thanks to lovely travel restrictions at the moment because that's got to be in Vegas. So that's been delayed for the last 18 months or so but yeah um luckily it doesn't really impact what we do so we get to sort of function and do everything that we enjoy every day so not going to be too upset about that cool okay well let's get cracking mm. Mm. Absolutely. So I guess um, we would like this to be a fairly interactive and casual, low-key sort of affair. Um, we don't want to really be here lecturing to people. Um, so if you do have questions, pop a question in the chat and we'll endeavour to answer that on the way through. Um, you can put your hand up as well. Um, we really want to just basically run through things as we would run through them with a client. Um, so to start with, we'll assess essentially um, go through um, what base narrow canines are or lingua verted canines, depending on what terminology you'd prefer. Um, we'd 
sort of also planning on um, going through almost like how we would a consult um, to sort of um, discuss how we explain things to clients and hopefully that can give you a few hints and tips on how to sort of convert them um, into sort of uh, doing procedures if they're warranted, um, also how to actually treat them. And this is just related to the puppies today. Obviously, with the rest of the series, we want to run through um, interceptive treatments as the permanent dentition's erupting. And um, once we've got permanent teeth through, how we actually approach and lots of things that you guys can do as well. We really want to try and make it relevant to you in practice. Um, and then the other thing is complications with extractions as well. Um, that's something that we're seeing a lot of. And I think we're seeing a lot of it because there are so many puppies with this condition. Um, and also we're intervening more. Uh, I think uh, in the past, we were not really as well educated and we didn't know um, what was going on so much. So a lot of these were sliding through. Um, so it's also something that's really important, I think, to be aware of and also discuss with the clients so they're fully educated before they make the decision to go ahead or not. So do you want to go through occlusion, Erin? Yeah, okay. So I guess... The, the term based narrow canine has been bandied around a lot. I, I personally don't mind it too much. Um, it, it is quite a catch-all phrase. Um, and and Beck already mentioned that um, sometimes the more correct term can be lingua-verted mandibular canines. Um, sometimes that's actually not the case either. Um, so it, it, ha it is an occlusal problem. It's a, it's a malocclusion. It's a problem with where the teeth 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 lie and where they end up and I guess that's that's an important thing that I discuss with with clients uh, is that these malocclusions when we're dealing with them we're not dealing with them because they look a bit funny a little bit funky we're dealing with these because they become a, a real clinical issue for these for these animals so this here is a diagram of um, uh, it's at, it's a permanent dentition diagram and it, this is the norm occlusion. This is where the teeth should sit in relation to each other. There are some missing molars in this image. But I guess to, to tonight, we're, what we're really interested in is we're really interested in here uh, on where the, the interaction is between the canines. Uh, so mandibular canine is, is, I guess, our focus, where it sits and where it should sit uh, is evenly between the upper third incisor and the, and the upper canine now this can be difficult sometimes to appreciate in the developing dog with the deciduous teeth uh, they, they change as well i think that that's a that's a i think can be a tricky thing back um they're changing all the time these guys it is absolutely and i guess that's a question that we're faced with a lot in that um you know people will be coming to you and they will have acquired this puppy you will have detected this problem and the question always is should this have been picked up before and absolutely mm -hmm. sometimes yes but of course we actually see things change from week to week as well with the growth of the maxilla and the mandible mandible being somewhat independent of each other so i actually had a pup last week that had been through its first and second vet checks and not detected um, and saw the same vet for the third check and um, it was noted as being okay and I 100% believe that and then um, had developed sort of um, a bit of a, an issue with the lower canine striking the palate and it was reasonably subtle. It wasn't these ones that are right in the middle of the palate but there was definitely trauma there and I think that may just be due to growth of the width of the maxilla compared to the mandible. So it's something that is constantly changing um, and that's important to, to realise as well that it's not going to stay sort of static. Yeah, and we're, we're certainly very aware of that because we do get, as, as I guess Beck already said, we do get that question, oh, why wasn't it picked up? And the reality is, is that these are completely in flux all the time and sometimes the issues that we're dealing with are very minute. These are half to one millimetre differences between being okay and not okay. So this is a normal occlusion here. We should have the lower canine sitting uh, evenly between those two teeth, the upper third and the upper canine. 
And importantly, what we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have uh, the mandibular canine or the maxillary canine, we shouldn't have their cranial tips striking soft tissue. That's absolutely not the case. So this diagram here, yeah, that, that's, this is a class two malocclusion. Um, frequently we call it an overbite. overbite yeah. This is a, the, a very common malocclusion that's associated with base narrow canines. Uh, and here we have the relative um, shortness of the, of the mandible. And it just places those uh, mandibular canines just in the wrong spot. They're, they're trying to do the right thing, but they, they simply can't get into the correct position. So I think that, that accounts for quite a lot of, of the um, base narrow cases we see in saying that, I think some of the images we've got coming up this morning are actually more like this next occlusal <laughs> problem that we have, yeah. <laughs> which is a, a class three malocclusion or an underbite. So again, there's this relative shift uh, where we have a, a relatively short maxilla. Um, commonly, they may present a bit like a boxer, and boxer has a, is, often has a class three malocclusion. Or your Frenchie, more Frenchy, common now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your brachies tend to do this a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be actually okay because the mandibular canines are outside of everything. <laughs> they, don't, they don't sit inside the mouth. But, but again, when they're not in the right position, um, in some of these more subtle cases, they can the tip of the canine can be incorrect. So in, in the next diagram, we have, I guess, we've got this um, front-on view of these dogs. Uh, and this, this really, I guess, describes the lingua version of the mandibular canine. So lingua, tongue, version, towards. So these mandibular canines are angled towards the tongue. So on the left of the screen, we have, this is the angle approximately uh, that mandibular canines should be jutting out at, and they should not be straight up and down like on the right hand mm -hmm. side here, because clearly, well, maybe not clearly, but if they do, then the tips of those canines will strike uh, the palate and they're gonna cause some problems. And I guess we also see variations of that as well. It's not necessarily as clear cut and that's where um, I guess there's no recipe for how to deal with these, especially in the permanent dentition, because there are so many variations. So commonly we will see with these purely what we call purely lingua verted or purely base narrow dogs. So classically labradoodle, cavoodle, um, where there's no jaw length abnormality. We'll often see that um, in some of these guys, the reason for the, the issue is that the mandibular canines are very upright. Um, for others, they are tilted at a fairly decent angle, but the maxilla width compared to the mandible width is what's actually not allowing the tips of those teeth to um, protrude past the soft tissue and actually impact into it. So it's important to realise that it's not as clean cut as these are just upright teeth. It's got a lot to do with the actual anatomy of the dog as well, and that will change between individuals. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they don't want to be straight up and down. And it can be because of these other malocclusions that they get forced to be straight up and down. They get caught behind or inside other teeth. Uh, we also see unilateral uh, issues as well. Um, yeah, but basically what we're looking at, we're looking at the mandibular canines. Uh, they're causing trauma uh, to, the, to, the, to the maxilla. Okay. So some pickies of the real life situation. So um, the little dog on the left-hand side of the screen, um, I guess this is what I would call at this stage, at least a purely lingua verted or a purely base narrow pup. Um, to me, we don't have a, um, an obvious jaw length abnormality. So the way I'm assessing that is basically through the incisor region here. I don't have mandibular incisors rostral or in front of the maxillaries. I also don't have them tip to tip. And um, basically um, it's the same or similar to the adult dentition or permanent dentition where the tips of those mandibular incisor teeth are actually um, sitting directly behind or on the actual little ridge or cingulum um, behind the maxillary incisor teeth. So based on that, I think the dog has what we call a scissor bite. Um, it's incisor relationship 
relationship is good. Um, it's premolar interdigitation. It's a little bit more difficult in puppies to assess than it is in adult dogs, but we've basically got this pretty decent sort of um, pinking shear effect back here, which gives me a reasonable confidence that there's not really a length issue. And you can also see there's a fairly sort of even gap here and here between the back of the third incisor and the front of the maxillary canine tooth. It's purely that this mandibular canine tooth here is impacting into the actual soft tissues. Um, so I would hazard a guess that this is a labradoodle puppy. Um, we seem to be seeing multiples of them every day. I think between you and I, one day we ended up having five in. Um, so it's it's a very common occurrence in these guys. Um, but yeah, for this one, I would consider that a purely sort of lingua verted or base neuro dog at this point in time, at least. Um, and with this sort of degree of trauma here, I would consider that uncomfortable for the dog and we would um, recommend treatment. Um, this one we don't have obviously picky in it with its closed mouth position, but you can see here and here, these are the um, little penetrating injuries to the soft, um, the soft tissues of the palate. Um, and that position basically indicates to me that this dog actually has a class three malocclusion or an underbite. Um, so its mandible is actually a little bit long compared to the maxilla. And I think that because of the position of these, they're not basically in this diastema. Um, and we refer to this as, I guess, the maxillary diastema broadly. It's the space between the third incisor and upper canine tooth. Um, and this is forward of that position. So for me, just looking at this, I would assess this dog as having an underbite. So you can see that we can have the same presentation with lingua version or base narrow canines, but a completely different occlusion problem. Um, this guy over here on the right hand side of the screen is similar again, um, but potentially even more, um, I guess, uh, significant in that class three, in that penetrating injury is even further forward on the palate. Um, this one down the bottom is actually a little interesting one. Um, to me, this doesn't fit into really the, the category of overbite or underbite. We have a bit more um, information on that one coming up as one of our sort of cases that we go through. Um, but you can see that, uh, I guess, one of these very two very upright. Yeah, very, very vertical. Also, the mandible itself um, looks quite narrow, but the maxilla is also tilted and skewed a little bit. So I would actually classify this as what we call a class four malocclusion. So it doesn't really fit into any of those other categories. Um, then I'll try and move this box. Um, and this one down here is often the classic one that we're seeing. Um, you can see penetrating injuries basically here and here on the actual palate. And actually, if you look here, there's little indentations along um, here as well, most likely from the incisor teeth. So this little guy has a class two or an overbite. Um, and these are what we'll see fairly commonly in, well, we're seeing a lot in little mini daxies at the moment. Um, we'll see it in staffies a fair bit as well. Labrador. Um, yeah, labbies, uh, a lot of the guide dogs actually. So we see it in, um, and also the black labs, we're seeing it in mm -hmm. quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I would say so, from this selection, any dog with tan hair probably is that yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is essentially where um, they almost don't have a choice but to be lingua verde, these guys in many cases, because the maxilla is long compared to the mandible um, and the mandibular canine teeth directly trap the actual mandibular canine teeth from tipping out into an appropriate position. Got anything to add to that? Not really. Uh, and, and, and I guess what we'll also do, we we have got some subtle ones coming through, but mm -hmm. you'll see it across the board, of course, with people when we lecture. We always show you the ones that I guess are sometimes the most obvious. Absolutely. I think actually, I think the next slide actually is just, yeah, this, see, this one is a subtle one. And um, th this was interesting. I was speaking to a veterinarian uh, two days ago when we were putting our finishing touches to this um, presentation and she was directly asking me about this case and asked and she's given me permission to use the the uh, the image I found it quite interesting uh, because there 
if we really look close, the, the tip of that mandibular canine is penetrating soft tissue, but, yeah. but only just. It, and I think, I think that can be a hard thing to get across is that these guys are not being stabbed to death. They're not about to keel over or anything like that. Um, but they have just this chronic little bits of damage all the time. And it's, it's not pleasant. No. This, dog, this dog I would hazard to say is probably uh, a class three. Um, the only reason I'm saying that is I can see that that mandibular canine is much closer to the third incisor than the canine, but I don't honestly actually probably have enough information to make that call. Yeah. But you know, I, I, that is, is, is causing trauma. There's also a question um, just on what an actual scissor bite is. So if we can run through that. Scissor bite is, um, I guess, often a term that breeders will use. Um, it's something that show people focus on almost absolutely. Um, so if you have any dealings with people that are showing dogs, you'll hear that word scissor bite, scissor bite, scissor bite. It really is related to the relationship of the incisor teeth um, and what they're looking at essentially is that the maxillary incisors are sitting just in front of the mandibular incisors and that's what they'll be referring to as a scissor bite. Um, you can get a level bite, which is where the tips of the maxillary and mandibular incisors meet um, and come tip to tip. And then you can also have a reverse scissor bite where you have, which is essentially a class three or an underbite, um, where you have the mandibular incisors sitting in front of the maxillary in sizes as well so very much a show person term um, and that's probably where we pick it up from a lot because we see and deal with a lot of those people um, but yeah I guess it really does almost purely in the way they talk about it especially relate to um, to the incisor relationship and when you're assessing a bite um, it is only one very very small part of um, I guess the actual um, the occlusal assessment and dogs with uh, actual scissor bite can still have a subtle um, overbite or underbite as well so it's important not to just look at that incisor relationship in isolation and declare that a dog has a normal bite you also need to look at the interlock between the canines and that's where we say they should have that nice even spacing between the back of the third incisor and the front of the maxillary canine tooth. And then you also want to look at the interdigitation of the premolars and it should be, you know, this sort of effect where you've got the little um, pinking shear type effect. You shouldn't have, um, I guess, the premolar teeth coming tip to tip. Um, the tip of one should sit in the valley between the, the um, two on the jaw below or above it. And you, you did mention it before, Beck, and I think that can be difficult to do in juvenile mouths. Absolutely. I think, I think in deciduous dentition it's hard. Yeah, and 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 particularly once like, animals are not going to be held onto for very long, you, they're going to be sold um, prior, them, prior to them having a permanent dentition. Um, so it can be really difficult to, to, to lay your money on the table um, yeah. for some of these cases. Yeah, I guess like the wording we will use on assessment today, this is what yeah. we see. We won't say that this dog has an excellent occlusion or, a, you know, class zero, which is normal. We'll say on assessment today, this is what we see um, because we realise that whilst they're growing, it is changing constantly. In saying that, I think that there's certainly there's, there's a lot come through where we can be quite confident with where they're going to end up. Um, but yeah, normal doesn't usually shift away from normal. <laughs> Uh, actually, that's a good point, Beck. Actually, I guess often the relationships that we see early on are carried through. We, they, they, whilst they are growing, they just get a bigger version of what they have mm -hmm. uh, when they're a, a young dog. But uh, I'm still, my door is open for, for people to come and shove a correct occlusion in my face and say, you were wrong. Um, haven't had it happen yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so... That's, I guess, a, a bit of a description and a few examples of, of the problem itself. Um, so next up we have, well, how do we... Has anyone got any specific questions oh, yeah. about that before we move on? Nope. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Jumping ahead. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's the, the slide I guess I want. So, yeah, so talking to a client about it, I guess when I was, we were talking about it, we had to boil it down to there are these 
four points I guess we really want to hit um, when we're discussing it with the client. I guess some of them they're already quite aware of. Again, through the referral um, system, these people are coming forward because they've had it explained quite well to them already by uh, yourselves. Um, we often are often repeating a lot of what you said, and, but we're just throwing that maybe a little bit of extra detail here and there. Um, but we often talk about the same things. There are people that are coming through still um, that see us that are still not quite sure about this, the problem. Is it a real problem? Um, I actually had one today that was went into a bit. And we didn't convince them it was a problem either. <laughs> no, well, I'm, no, I didn't convince him. I've failed with him. Um, but he didn't believe it was a problem. Um, I, I guess I, I think it's pretty simple, I think, to, to do, get people to believe it's, it's an issue. And again, in context, this is not the dog rolling over and dying. This is not agony every time the dog closes his mouth. It's discomfort. Um, but it's chronic. It, it just is happening all the time. So I, I, the way I've, all, I've put it for a very long time now is that we've all played with these with these dogs. I like doing it. It's, from a behaviour point of view, it's not probably the right thing to do when you're in consultation to, to let them bite you, but we do. And we're not rolling around with blood pouring out of our hand, but it is mildly uncomfortable when they do bite your hand. That is what that dog experiences every time it closes its mouth. Yeah. So I think that that alone is good enough for me as a problem to try and alleviate for these pups. Yeah, and I guess we personally don't make out that it's agony and I think that people seem to appreciate that, um, that, yes, it's a problem, it's something, and they say, oh, but it's fine and it's also it's been living with this from the time it's like five, six weeks of age or four weeks yeah. even. Um, they don't really know any different. Um, a lot of people, if you question them, will say that, yeah, they are particularly mouthy. It's Again, it's hard to assess because all puppies are mouthy to some degree um, but feedback for us after we've removed deciduous canines and you know treated permanence as well is that behavior seems to noticeably settle down in the very short um, period yeah. after having the procedure done um, we've had dogs that you know a lot of them constantly have things in their mouth or even ones that will sleep with a toy or something basically to act as a bit of a spacer um, in their mouth as well so that sort of questioning a lot of people will sort of, you know, find that some of those behaviours are occurring and it can help them sort of say that, okay, well, maybe it is a little bit of an issue for them as well. So, yeah, I guess we don't try and make out its agony, um, but certainly, you know, try to point out that there is at least discomfort present. Um, and from that point of view, we feel that treatment's warranted. Yeah. Um, there's also, I guess, a little bit of a, um, something that is brought up a lot where um, treatment by removal of these deciduous canine teeth will correct the bite. Um, in theory, it's possible. And we've seen them, you know, where we've removed deciduous canines and the permanent dentition has come through appropriately. Would that have always happened? Quite possibly it would have, especially in some of these subtle, purely lingoverted dogs. Um, I think with or without treatment, the permanent dentition may be okay. Um, but there's this thought that you're removing dental interlock um, where you've got um, the mandibular canine teeth penetrating the soft tissues in the maxilla, and that's creating a bit of a lock that's preventing the mandible from growing forward or out. It's, I think, most commonly um, sort of something that's stated with pups with a, um, a class two or an overbite. Um, I guess, yes, in theory, removing those teeth can free things up. And if the genetics say that that jaw is going to catch up, it gives it the potential to. Um, but oftentimes the genetics don't say that. So we don't focus on it. Um, I guess we will basically have that conversation and let them know that, yeah, okay, it may help um, if they're creating an interlock and the jaw is trying to grow, that it will relieve that sort of um, that interlocking and yeah. allow that to occur um, but we are also pretty clear in if you know you've got a fairly significant malocclusion it's very likely that you're going to be dealing with this 
um, when the permanent teeth erupt as well. Yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a, a pretty important point, I think, when we discuss this. And in fact, I often will split the, the consultation really into part A, which is all about these deciduous teeth and how we're going to approach them. And then I will have a part B where I at least introduce the ideas of, of how we may address the permanent dentition if yeah. it goes down this yeah. road. Which is all very easy for us to do as well because that's the only thing we've got to talk yeah. about with these people <laughs> where you're covering everything in a puppy consult or what have you, but they're little things that you can at least try and introduce along the way. Um, yeah. So, so I, I guess, and as we all know, like it's important, for, communication is important and managing expectations. And I guess that's probably where it really came from with us is just we want to get in early we don't know want, want to destroy their hopes, but we want to let them know that it is unlikely that a lot of these will go on and mm. be better because we've done this. Yeah. So for us, our real focus here, and I guess we haven't even said it, or we probably have a little bit, the treatment that we're talking about is, is removal of these deciduous canines, deciduous mandibular canines. The, the teeth that are causing that trauma, that's... That's what we want to address in these young animals. We want to remove those teeth to stop the trauma. And as we've written there, it, it does offer the fastest path to relief. Um, years ago, Gary and I toyed with doing height reduction on these deciduous teeth. That was an utter failure. Um, in the end, they're there for five, four or five months. Um, let's just get these dogs pain-free um, and we can, we can deal with, with part B later. But importantly, I think that the final point there is really important to mention. Um, well, it's not, not, we don't mention it. We talk about it. It's mm. these, this re removal, this trauma of having deciduous teeth removed can affect the developing teeth that are associated uh, with them. And, it's, and as we'll, we'll talk about a little later, it, we're not just talking about the canines. Uh, the developing canines certainly can be affected by the trauma of extraction, um, but we will also um, occasionally see incisor issues as well. I don't. I personally don't think it's common, um, but we do see a fair bit. And as Beck mentioned before, we're. I think we're seeing more because more are being treated overall. Yeah, absolutely. But we'll, we'll, but we'll, we'll address that um, actually as our final sort of section. Yeah, of there's a um, question from Cara as well. So we're just about to get to that as well um, when we talk about extraction. So we'll come back to that in a sec. Okay. You're not watching, are you? <laughs> I wasn't popping up in my window. <laughs> The other thing that um, we'll go into and show you some um, recent examples we've um, seen um, is to really make sure that you also give the, um, I guess, the pros and cons to the owners of um, removal of these deciduous canine teeth. For me, um, in the very vast majority of cases, the benefit to the pup outweighs any risk, um, but we see these complications with enough frequency that I really really think it's worth addressing if they don't occur great owner's really happy and they think you're awesome if they do occur at least they've been prepared and they've made an informed decision um, so uh, the things that we see most commonly um, is enamel damage so that can be incredibly subtle to like a little pinprick lesion on the lateral or labial surface of the lower canine tooth um, up until up until basically no enamel forming on the tooth. Um, we can also see damage of the um, mandibular incisor teeth. Um, and we've also seen um, teeth that have just failed to erupt or have been damaged and the crowns have been misshapen or grown in a, um, in a, a fashion that has actually prevented them coming all the way through. So um, I guess when we address it, I sort of say, you know, um, I guess there are potential complications with this as well. I feel that the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, the most common thing and by far the most common if it occurs at all is the subtle enamel damage. And for most of them, that can be purely cosmetic. Um, if it's a bit more significant, it can result in some sensitivity of the tooth. Very hard to assess if that's bothering the dog or not, but we know in ourselves that it can, um, especially in 
um, immature and developing teeth. So for those, it may be that they need a sealant placed or an actual um, composite filling, as we would get. Um, and that will often sort things out right up until, we'll say, we've had the, the odd case um, or very few over the years where um, teeth have actually not erupted. And that results in, you know, bigger surgical requirements to deal with that and the likes of it. Most people aren't really turned off by it or scared, but um, I guess you approach it in a way where at least you're informing them of what can go wrong. Um, so if and when it does, because if you do enough, it will, um, they at least have had a bit of a heads up. Yeah, the way I often explain it to people as well, uh, I, I, I and I, I truly believe this, I don't believe that the issue is necessarily that we're physically traumatising the developing teeth with our instruments, but all extractions require trauma. Now, as long as it's less on us and more with around the tooth, it's because we need to break down periodontal ligament, we have to traumatise it. All that trauma is going to cause inflammation and then the inflammatory process itself will interfere um, with the developing ameloblasts, et cetera. So I think that's why we see it. Um, not so much that we're just jamming things in there and really. No, I think that's the very right. occasional time that we see things. Yeah. I mean, it happens, you slip, things. Yeah, don't absolutely. No, I certainly had it happen myself. Absolutely. None of us are perfect. Um, the other thing I guess uh, we do tend to talk about a little bit, um, we've had quite a few cases come through recently. And I think, again, it's because just so many more are being seen. Um, we'll have them come through at like that four and a half month of age mark or even from four months on so onwards. Um, I still recommend extraction of the deciduous teeth at that point in time, but also maybe make sure you mentioned that those teeth have a very limited lifespan um, and that if you went ahead and spent this money and removed these teeth today in as little as four weeks, they could have permanent teeth coming through um, and they may be back in a similar position. So um, we are also fairly careful to make sure if we've got a slightly more mature pup um, that we're upfront. And I'd say we probably have 50-50. Some people decide to go ahead at that point and others don't. Um, so I'm comfortable with that i'd like all of them to have the procedure done but timing for a lot of the, um, these cases you just don't get them at the right time like some of these have been adopted at four and a bit months of age they go to their first vet check with their new owners and it's the first opportunity anyone's had to um, to be able to address that with them so just also you know be mindful of the age of the animal as well and um, just having a really open discussion with the owner so they've got you know I guess their expectations are managed essentially. Yeah, yeah. And Tamara's asked that question. So how early, what's the earliest we'd extract? Uh, I'm hovering around this eight weeks of age. Um, we don't tend to see them beforehand, I uh, think. Yeah, yeah, we don't have the opportunity. And I think in years ago, and some of you probably have heard me say this, and certainly Gary said this a, a lot, we would actually go, we would never approach them prior to 12, 12 weeks of age. Um, we felt that that, was too close to this enamel development period. Um, but I think what really changed that is that we, I've seen enamel changes to um, adult teeth when we know that the deciduous teeth were taken out at four months of age. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's just it's just a matter of just being careful and being upfront, as Beck said. Um, the, I guess the other thing we do talk about too, and uh, it doesn't come up that often, but if these people, um, again, present presenting to you guys or through referral, they've, they've turned up a little later in this, uh, maybe at this four months of age, four and a half months of age, these teeth are about to be shed. So I'm certainly letting them know this um, and it's up to them whether they want to yeah. go for a couple of weeks of relief. Um, and, of course, we all know that it, the medical side of things is not the whole story. There are a lot of other practicalities that people have to take into account when they're making um, decisions. Okay. Um, yeah, so that, I, I guess, oh, is close. Sorry, we have an intruder. Um, <laughs> hey, hello, Michael. Um, Michael's got a good bite. Um, 
So that's a client discussion. So they're, like, they're the big points that we would like to raise and cover off on. It is uncomfortable. Whilst not agony, it is, is uncomfortable. Extraction of these teeth is going to relieve the dog immediately. Uh, it, it's, we don't feel that it really has a huge impact on whether the permanent teeth are going to be better. Um, in fact, it's quite unlikely to have any effect, whether negative or positive. And there is a, a risk here of, of damage to the developing teeth underneath. We might jump straight through to treatment, you reckon, Beck? Yeah, I think so. There's yeah. lots of questions coming up about treatment, so we'll come back to specific cases in a minute. There we go. So um, I guess straight up we can answer some of these questions yeah. as well. Um, I guess one is basically have we ever considered gingivoplasty of the deciduous canines if it's just catching? Yes, considered it. Not ventured that far yet, um, and we're actually very tempted to. Um, and a colleague in Perth, um, Kevin, um, Kevin, um, he's one of the specialists over there. He has recently done a case and we're still waiting to hear on follow-up. I think, unfortunately, that pup's been lost to follow-up, um, but he attempted that on, um, on a young pup. And I guess post-op, everything looked great, um, but we were hoping to see sort of the longer term. I guess with these sorts of things, um, to my mind, it potentially... Um, you know, it could be very beneficial to them um, in that we are not interfering with the teeth themselves. We're just changing the shape of the, the tissue. Um, but again, I, I don't know, I'm always hesitant to sort of attempt something that hasn't previously really been written up or anything on a client's animal. We love to do this stuff on other vets' animals or <laughs> industry, um, people in the industry. Um, so we're always hoping for someone to get a dud puppy and come through from work. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting concept and something I think that will be explored more and more over the coming um, sort of months and years. So it's something to watch yeah. out for. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, and uh, yeah, we're going to address this, I guess, as we go through this, but Danielle's got a, a good question here about if we see any difference in, in trauma to the permanent dentition between whether we're going for a uh, an open or closed extraction, so surgical or closed extraction. Um, I am stubborn. Um, <laughs> I still, I still frequently um, extract in a closed fashion. In saying that, I, I am now doing many more uh, in a surgical fashion. I think the advantage of surgery is that you've got access to things, and you've got access to the areas um, of, of dental attachment that are not closely associated with the developing teeth. So if we can work here on the labial surfaces uh, or surface of, of the deciduous canine, yeah, we can break down these tissues we need to do to extract it without being too close to the developing yeah. tooth. So, yeah, I, I see a lot of advantages in surgery. I use surgery. Maybe. Yeah, that does. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm stubborn. I mean, I am changing slowly. <laughs> This one you've been very stubborn on. Um, yeah. I guess, the, and that's the thing, even within our practice, we have different approaches to things and different things work in different people's hands. So personally, I like the surgical approach. I'd say my surgical approach is more conservative than a lot of other people's as well. Um, I tend to make, and I'll, I'll show you as we move along um, with this section, but I tend to just make um, a single incision um, door basically behind the deciduous canine tooth back up into as far as the premolar tooth if I need to. I don't make, um, I guess I'll draw on here for you, my incision basically will run back to as next far slide, as here. Um, and there's a lot of other people that will make um, essentially an incision, a vertical incision as well. So they've got more of a triangular flap to actually peel that whole sort of um, wall of soft tissue back down for exposure. For me personally, I find just this sort of um, dorsal incision, it releases the gingiva enough. It allows me to pull um, the soft tissue down 
and I can then um, basically get the exposure that I'm comfortable with to allow me access and see what I'm doing. Um, I also find that for me that wall of, or plate of bone um, along the buckle sort of surface, some people will um, specifically use a burr to remove that so they can see things and for better access, nothing wrong with that at all. For me, I don't find that I need it um, anymore. I used to do it a little bit, um, but for, for me at the moment, it doesn't really add too much benefit. So again, it's what works in your hands and what you're comfortable with. Um, and I think over time, you'll change your approach as well as you do more and you, you sort of become a little bit more confident and competent with things as well. So um, I guess explore all options, figure out what works for you and stick with it. Um, that's, I guess, our best advice because I think between you, Gary, and myself, when we were all working together, we all had a slightly different approach and we all had pretty similar outcomes. Yeah, and actually, I think to be a little bit more, to elaborate a little bit more um, in myself doing closed extractions, I think that I, it works better for, well, it works well for me because of my instrumentation. So I use very, I use thin luxators. Yeah. So I'm not trying to use bulky uh, instruments down in that small space. So with the difference, if you're not aware of that, there is a difference between elevation and luxation of teeth. I'm here. Yeah, ele elevation is where we really force um, a, a, an object between the tooth and the alveolar wall and something's got to give. So it's, it hopefully is the tooth. So you're basically pushing this tooth out of the way. Whereas with luxation, we're using very thin um, instruments that are sh that sharply dissect away that periodontal ligament um, specifically. Um, so I, I think that's maybe why I'm getting away with it. Now, again, in saying that, do I get away with it all the time? No, I've had my own patients come back that have had um, enamel trauma. Hmm. And so, we all have, like, yeah. there is, I don't know if you've done enough, it's going to happen. There's just yeah. no way of always avoiding it. So if it happens to you, don't think you've done a, a terrible job. Like sometimes... Yeah. The oh, no, space it's, you've got to work in is small. A patient's inflammatory response, you know, they're all a little bit different. So, yeah. um, mostly you've done it. Mostly it's animals' fault. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, there's another question as well about um, basically it's from whether or not if you're removing the deciduous canine, if you fracture the root, um, whether or not you need to remove that root or not. Um, for me, I always do because I'm perfectionist and I just can't deal with not getting it out. Um, I think it, I guess the basis of it is you need to think of why you're actually extracting that tooth. Um, for this, these specific scenarios, I think it's really, really important that you at least try to get it out, but it's always a balance between the benefit to the patient and the risk of damage. Um, so if you're really not confident, you've got a little bit left, um, then you may well just be better off leaving it than um, sort of hunting around and risking a lot of damage to the permanent dentition. Um, chances are, hopefully, it's going to resorb um, in the right timing and not um, block the position or the correct movement of the permanent canine tooth. Um, but the risk of leaving it in these guys when they're so young, I don't think infections are high risk or anything like that, unless you're leaving the root of a fractured canine behind, they abscess very quickly. Um, if the canine was intact, I don't think infections are big risk. The risk for me is that you've already got um, this lingua version as a problem. Um, and if we have retention of that root and it doesn't resorb, it could act as a physical obstruction for the permanent tooth being able to move into the correct position. Yeah. So you sort of, in some ways, um, potentially negating some of the benefit of doing the procedure. Yeah, that's something we're, we're going to touch on over the next couple of webinars um, because that, that's something that we have to be on the lookout um, for around this four or five months of age mm -hmm. when they should transition from uh, deciduous through to permanent. Yeah. So, yeah, so leaving the root behind, yeah, as Beck said, it can be a physical impediment if it doesn't go through normal resorption. Yeah, absolutely. Which, which you have no idea whether it's going to happen or not. And I don't think it really is affected by a live tooth or not. Um, so the fragment itself, it can still go through resorption, whether it's dead or alive. Mm. 
Yeah, for sure. And I guess, you know, if you're removing a deciduous tooth in a seven month old dog, all its permanent teeth are through and the occlusion is okay. So it's just a purely retained tooth and it's not interfered with the occlusal relationship at all. Leaving a fragment of root behind is at the end for the dog? Probably not. Um, I guess if we don't take things out completely, we'll always at least let owners know um, so that they're aware. Um, and I think that's something about just confidently telling them you don't need to, you know, crawl to them and say, oh, this happened. It's that, you know, we were doing this. Um, there's a little bit of root fragment left behind. Um, sometimes this occurs on a risk benefit ratio, the risk of us persisting to try and get that was going to be you know exposing and damaging the root of that permanent tooth that's far important that we keep that intact so we've decided to leave that we'll just keep an eye on it like at least they're informed you've let them know but you're also um you know you're not making it out to be something that it's bigger than it necessarily is yeah yeah absolutely yeah it's, it's not a disaster yeah okay so i think the next slide um just goes through, um, I think it was one of yours the other day, Beck. Well, it must be because it's surgically. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so the incision here, and we can see that um, incision just over the top, no vertical incisions here. Yeah. Um, Beck's creating this, this envelope, here. an envelope flap here. Um, and, and also just Nick just between the third incisor and canine, and that will give you slightly more exposure if you need to. If it's not enough, there's no harm in basically making a little vertical incision down here as well. I've gone away from it because I found I had more issues with breakdown um, when I made that vertical incision. The tissue was more like it was it was flapped open further. Um, so if the pup managed to remove sutures, then that would open up further. They all healed fine. It just took an extra week or so. And, um, you know, if you hadn't said anything to owners, they probably would have remained oblivious to it. Um, but I've found since just doing this um dorsal incision i really have no issue with breakdown at all and i'm not um essentially putting restrictions on diet or anything like that with people i'm happy for them to maintain the same diet i will just say no sort of mouth games or tug for about five days post-op um, and then with that technique i don't to my knowledge tell me if you, anyone's seen any of mine that have had big issues um, to my knowledge, they're, they're healing fine without concern at all. And yep. most of them, you see them a week later and you'd never know anything had been done. Yeah, they're quick, aren't they? Everyone's they are like, really quick with well. puppies. Yeah. And then you don't even use sutures at all if you do a non-surgical. So yours go home with really no limitations put on them at all. Yeah, they just have to recover that afternoon and then back to their yep. rambunctious souls. Yeah. Absolutely. So then um, I guess on the picture below, we're just using a really fine periosteal elevator um, and we're just basically um, lifting that soft tissue and periosteum off the bone. Um, I find that the um, that bone is so thin that you can really, you almost you lift it off with, with you. your, yeah, sometimes you'll actually inadvertently lift it off with your periosteal elevator that's fine. doesn't worry me at all. Um, and you can see here just with that tissue sort of being flapped backwards and I'm just pushing it down with the periosteal elevator there. Um, you've automatically basically got um, this much exposure of root material. So for me, that's plenty of access. It allows me to just guide where I want my um, luxator to go. Um, and I just feel a little bit more confident. And also the tissue's not quite as tight. Um, and for me, I feel I get movement a lot sooner than if I don't um, do that surgical incision. So that's my preference. Um, for the next one. Um, so this basically is just trying to show you what angles we take um, when you're actually um, removing any tooth. One of the keys is to actually remember the angle that the root goes in. I think this one's good because you're actually missing the crown of the tooth. So ordinarily the crown would sort of sit at this angle. You don't want your um, luxator or elevator going down at this angle because that's following the angle of the crown. We actually have the root of the tooth. Well, that's a terrible picture. Let me do that again. 
but the root of the tooth essentially is running down here. Um, so we want the long axis <laughs> is that blown up on yours or just mine. Yeah, it's blown up. <laughs> I don't know how to get rid of that. Now it's blowing up more. <laughs> Technical issues now. Actually, I, while you're getting that back to normal, I'll quickly address. <laughs> I'll quickly address Ruth, uh, Ruth's question. She just asked about um, if the presence of, of sutures ever caused trauma to the erupting adult tooth. Not that I've ever come across. They're not persistent. Um, <clears throat> we use monocin. It's, it's in and out over a couple of weeks. Um, and honestly, if a, an erupting tooth can't penetrate through that, then they're, they're going to have a lot of problems. Mm. Um, and I guess otherwise... Um, trauma, yeah, we're not we're not driving big deep sutures in here. This is still just gingival tissue that yeah, we're closing. Absolutely. So now I've got it back under control. Um, you can see. I think also this, um, I guess, opening and creating this little flap allows because the tissue isn't so tight around the tooth. It allows me to get my luxator in at a better angle. Um, you're not sort of automatically being directed down. You can angle it a little bit um, a flatter. Um, so you can see the long axis of my actual luxator here is fairly well following the actual long axis of the root of the tooth. We're ignoring the actual position of the crown. So it's really important when you're trying to remove any tooth um, that essentially you are um, you sort of visualising that in your head and you are ensuring that your instruments are travelling essentially as close to the long axis of the tooth as possible. Um, so we really want to essentially avoid um, any real elevation or luxation on the lingual aspect. If you're going down on the inside of that tooth, that's the area where you're most likely to cause trauma to the developing um, incisor teeth and the developing permanent canine tooth. I will sort of run my um, blade or my luxator around that lingual aspect because you do need to release the gingival attachment, but I won't actually drive it down into the tissue. So um, often you'll find if you have, you've missed that step and you haven't done it, as soon as you run your sort of instrument around fairly superficially, you'll feel that little pop and the last little release, and then you'll be able to sort of get that tooth out. So we want to sort of run down the mesial aspect, which is basically the front of the tooth here. Front of the tooth here. Um, you can run down the back of the tooth as well, and you can also come down this labial surface. So they're the three surfaces that we really want to focus on um, and make sure that we're concentrating the bulk of our elevation or luxation. Um, so really sort of try to visualise where the root is running, try and run your instrument along that. And you'll actually often be able to feel it sort of running along. And if you're using something really fine, this is a two millimeter um, luxator. It's a Sislac instrument. I really love it. Um, I use it for pretty much all my cat extractions as well as these guys. I've gone away from using the actual deciduous um, extraction or um, what are they even called now? The deciduous. I guess it's a deciduous elevator. Yeah, yeah elevator. They're the ones with the, the curved end. Um, I did have a picture of one back here because we still have them in our kits, these ones. Mm. Um, so I tend to avoid them. I find them too chunky um, and the, the ends of them are just too thick, whereas mm. this is um, a really super, super fine instrument and it'll actually almost cut the ligament of the tooth. Um, yeah. That, that, that was a question just before as well that I, I typed the answer to. Someone was asked what instruments we use. Uh, yeah, Sislac, we're not exclusive to them or anything like that. They do make um, great instruments. Um, we both have curved instruments in our kits as well and curve both ways. Um, I, I do agree, but I tend to mostly use my straight fine elevator. Uh, like yeah. <clears throat> but curve do come in handy. I think that the more elevated you have, the better. You should always as much have as much selection as you can but yeah yeah um there's a question as well about whether we use a vet <coughs> home. um we don't actually have a vet time in the practice um it wasn't for us i think it has and it has a place and in certain people's hands and for certain situations it's great um i guess for us we move around and it was just an extra piece of equipment that we never unpacked we did trial one for a while um but yeah. for these situations 
I haven't tried it on deciduous teeth, so I don't feel like we're really qualified to comment, but my concerns are that that vibration um, may actually create more inflammation um, and I would be worried that it potentially could create more damage. I'm really comfortable with, I guess, the technique that I use now um, mm -hmm. and I don't think it can ever replace actually knowing how to surgically extract a tooth. Um, but, yeah, I know people that are using it seemingly it works well in their hands um it's just it it wasn't something that really fitted with us and what we do but um, i think do you think it has a place yeah i think my comment on that would be um that it, the action is is similar to what we actually are doing we mm -hmm. are we are, we luxate um with these teeth and so that is what a periotome should be doing mm -hmm. um it, it's a luxating device it's not an elevating device no, so it should be replicating the action. um but i i agree and that we should be all be um competent in 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 hand instrumentation to extract before we move on to something like a vet tome i guess my concern would be um lack of feedback when we're dealing with these these fine teeth but yeah. I, I don't i don't think it's necessarily uh, an, an aggressive problem um, no it, it, yeah for me just that you're right the tactility wasn't quite there um i found that it was a heavy sort of instrument to hold so because of the weight of it i lost a lot of the tactile feedback and for me um I guess that's something that as you develop your sort of skill over time, that tactility is key for me. Like I can pop my luxator in and tell exactly where the attachment remains. And I don't think I'd be able to sort of do that with something, um, you know, as big and chunky as a vet time. So, yeah, it's also just going slow and um, sort of, you know, feeling through your hand, um, you know, often there'll still be a bit of attachment um, just right at this sort of distal aspect. That's the bit that seems to sort of catch me up most. Um, and just by giving it a little wiggle and a move, you can often feel exactly where it is and then you can work on that area specifically. So I guess that's why we've chosen to do the technique we do and why we do it the way we do. But even if just discussing it with us tonight, like you can see that we do things differently between ourselves. So, um. actually, I guess no one's actually asked the question, but um, it takes time. Mm. These are yes, they're they're little teeth, but they take a lot of time to do properly. They um, are, and, and and we need to af afford that time for them because, as we're about to talk, do we want to go on to um, complications, back? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, as we're about to talk about with complications, I think if we rush things, as annoying and frustrating as they can be, you just want to get it done. Um, I think that's when we're certainly um, are more likely to run into problems. So this guy here, um, we we know when it had uh, this deciduous um, canines extracted, and you can just I did see these ones. <laughs> Just in the right. I wasn't going to say that, back. No, oh, I'm happy to admit. <laughs> a vet from San, Saint Elsewhere Hospital did this one. Um, yeah, and we can just see if you just get in the right light. There's, there's that little divot in that enamel on on the labial surface of that. That's uh, throwing it up again. Three o four. It's not horrendous. It's also it's nothing that I'd be overly concerned about. I don't believe I that that. That uh, that requires any intervention, um, but it's, it's happened, and um, it's happened when we were careful. Mm. Uh, so it it does happen. Yeah. So I guess that's the subtle um, ones. We have have a couple more here that are a little bit more um, problematic. <clears throat> now it won't let me flip to the next page. <laughs> um. So staining uh, of enamel it's the staining itself is not caused by um, the, the trauma the, sta the staining comes up because the enamel itself is not um, formed correctly so that so once it's erupted it it, it pulls in uh, stain quite easily so here we have this this um poor 404 um has really the ameloblasts that were making the enamel there really copped to hiding um they've done an all right job right at the tip but a significant portion oh, of that the was, tip. <laughs> yeah, a significant proportion of that enamel is, is just not formed at all mm -hmm. um and we can see we can eat and so much so you can see it on x-ray there 
Uh, yeah. Which is a bit concerning. Uh, the, the 403 also is involved, uh, and we do have another case coming up that the the O3s do get involved with this. Mm -hmm. Again, what we've got to remember is it wasn't the damage didn't occur when all these crowns were up where they are now. This is when they're all down, lower in the jaw, all forming together. Um, yeah, absolutely. You can up. see, I think with this case, before we saw it, um, it had actually had the third incisor extracted. Um, it was very damaged. You can see here that there's, um, loss of density here on this second incisor as well. Um, and you can also just see it sort of through here. So there's enamel damage there as well. Um, so, you know, two incisors plus the canine were damaged in this case. Um, and this actually also was really poorly erupted on this lower um, picture down here. You can see that the direction of eruption has been impacted, but it's actually um, not reached its full height either um, and you can see it on x-ray but it became very obvious um, we actually extracted this tooth because the owners didn't want to go through anything involved or want any long-term follow-up um, and there was concern that the tooth was going to be uncomfortable for the dog and also a risk of sort of uh, what we call pericoronitis because it was poorly erupted um, so there's actually a fold in the crown here yeah. um, and this is all you could see above the actual gum um, and there was you know still crown material down below the gum line and that fold seemed to be um, the thing that had not been able to penetrate through the bone and what had caused it to actually erupt so poorly. Yeah. I think um, Danielle's asked a question here about the, the pulp width. I It looks a bit weird, mate, because I think we've it's got the, the angles. Kids at different angles. Yeah, so this, um, this abnormal one was really labially tipped and almost rotated compared to um, the normal sort of tooth. Um, so it's just the, yeah, it's one almost lying sideways so you're getting a side-on view of the pulp chamber versus a more vertical sort of view of the pulp chamber they're big aren't they <laughs> <laughs> canines have huge pulp chambers when they're juvenile yeah. they do. and this guy was 11 months so um had developed complete apexes and everything in actual um they were somewhat mature teeth compared to what we'd be seeing at sort of five six months of age uh, this one was a cool little one. This is little Murphy. Um, I might flick to his x-rays first. He had, um, I guess, one of the more spectacular complications that we see. Um, he'd had deciduous teeth erupted and we presume, we don't know for sure, but we presume that this is a direct consequence of that. And um, he also had fairly significant um, enamel damage on the vast majority of his incisors as well. Um, I was I didn't take lots of pre-op photos on this one, unfortunately. Um, but you can see here, um, you couldn't actually see that tooth at all within the oral cavity. It was completely um, subgingival. Um, it the very, very tip of this tooth had just come through bone. So on this um, image, it's that little bit there was the only thing protruding through the bone itself. Um, and this is after surgical exposure. I had extracted this third incisor simply because it was so damaged. Um, it was also right in the pathway of um, I guess the way I would need to remove that tooth. And we did sacrifice the first premolar as well, just to get our exposure. Um, we took sort of more of a dorsal approach where we took um, the dorsal wall of the mandible off to get us some exposure. So we could sort of pull it out front and upwards. Um, and that all went very well, but you can see on X-ray here, this tooth, um, the apex of the tooth is all the way back level with the, the distal root of the third premolar. Ordinarily, we'll see um, this canine tooth end at around sort of somewhere between the mesial and distal roots of the second premolar. So it's a whole tooth back in the actual mandible. Um, and it's basically lying horizontally. So this image on the left-hand side of the screen um, demonstrates that well. Um, essentially, yeah, it's just basically lying completely horizontally 
um, without with the tip just yeah. protruding through the actual bone itself. So that's one of the, the bigger complications that we will see. Um, you can see we ended up doing a height reduction on the, um, the right canine. Um, the owners elected to do that to preserve some jaw structure and just save him going through a, a bigger yeah. procedure on the day yeah so, so i guess the problem we're addressing and you, and you did you mentioned it before back was uh, is really for these guys that have actually partially erupted we're really trying to address perichorinitis and if you haven't come across that term before uh peri around coronitis the crown um and itis inflammation so the issue is with any tooth um doesn't need to necessarily be damaged at all but if it hasn't erupted completely um, gingiva does not attach to enamel, even, even damaged enamel. Um, so what you find is that you have these large, very large um, pockets around them. So what do we know about periodontal pockets, or big pockets around teeth? They accumulate a lot of plaque. So these guys are just an absolute haven for periodontal disease. Mm -hmm. So this is why we're addressing them. Um, not, not because of, I guess, dentigerous cyst formation. If they have erupted, they we generally expect that the, the cyst, cyst itself has been ruptured. Um, but dentigerous formation is what we will be addressing if we have no eruption. Yeah, absolutely. So this one um, back here, um, he was potentially yeah, this is a, at this risk is a of that. Guy. <laughs> oh, this one. <laughs> yeah, I like this one. Yeah. Can anyone see what's wrong with this one? Anyone has it, want to hazard a guess? Because I missed it when I first looked at it and then looked again and went, oh. <laughs> I missed it the other night putting the pictures in. <laughs> Why are we putting this one up? It's got. So, uh, what you can see here is this little shadow. And then if you count the number of incisors, you'll note that there's an incisor missing. Um, so if I remove that, hopefully they stand out a little bit more if they didn't before. So this guy ended up with an impacted third incisor um, and he had had um, deciduous extractions. He also had enamel damage over here. Um, it was reasonably significant on that canine tooth um, on the left-hand side. But yeah, this, um, this 403 was well and truly impacted. Um, we're yet to decide what to do with that. Um, his owners are very hesitant to remove teeth. My concern is that we would have to remove the canine to access that third incisor um, to actually get it without damaging that tooth would be really hard, but we need to weigh up the potential risk of dentigerous cyst formation on that. And depending sort of what um, articles you look at and sort of research that can be anywhere from 20 to sort of 40, 50 percent of the risk. Um, he has had a height reduction of one of these teeth. One was sitting in a non traumatic position, the other was driving right up into the palate. So we will be monitoring him very regularly with radiographs. But the other problem is we don't actually know how frequently we need to do that as a screening test for dentigerous cyst formation as yeah. well. So that one is. Is due to come back in another month or so for his first follow-up so we'll see where we're at and um yeah it's an interesting one but we've had a yeah, few yeah. of those as well i think you've seen one or two yeah as well. i had a couple i didn't get you the x-rays for it but um yeah i've got bilateral um thirds that are uninterrupted and we've chosen to do the same thing because for exactly the same reasons i think we're putting those um those canines at risk and in fact would probably i agree have to we damage them so much if we're yeah. trying to spare them that uh, we'd have to take them out anyway. So, yeah, I think monitoring is, is a, a viable and reasonable approach. Yeah. Um, there's a question there about are they painful? So I, I don't think that the impacted teeth that are necessarily painful for them. There's I no guess reason they should be. No, it's potentially similar to us having unerupted wisdom teeth. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you? No, I've had mine removed. No, um, I've, got, no, I've only got three. That's why I'm not so smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they can become painful if you've got that situation where you've got pericoronitis, so you've got a partially or poorly erupted tooth and you start to get infection around that. Um, that's when they're uncomfortable. Even dogs with dentigerous cysts, 
don't appear to present in a painful fashion. And I think that's partly why we see them get so big with half their jaw destroyed before anyone's even necessarily aware of it and why they're often just purely incidental findings. So um, not really reported to be painful in people. We imagine probably not painful for these guys as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so look, they're, they're, the, they're the major, I guess, kind of complications we see. These are infrequent. I, I love cases like we've just shown, but but more more often, more most often, nothing happens. That's they don't have you don't have problems. But when you do, usually it's just some staining and some just mild changes to the enamel. Um, here we can see some incisors that have been involved, and yet the canine itself. Totally fine. It's fine. It, it, it didn't cop, cop anything. Um, and you can see here it's bilateral on incisor three and, and two. Um, so, yeah, it, it happens. Um, again, we're trying to uh, refine our techniques to, to keep our trauma really right around that um, deciduous tooth root um, only only. Um, yeah, we hope to really reduce the chances of that occurring. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay, we, it's it is eight forty five. We will talk all night on this one. <laughs> I, I, I guess we've we've hit all the big points we really wanted to. Yeah. Um, if you've got any questions, just yeah, throw them, them at us. us well. um, yeah. Here we go. Ah, really good point. Um, someone has re- asked, in mild cases, can we recommend ball play or ball therapy? Um, in our experience, ball therapy doesn't seem to do anything for the deciduous dentition because we are dealing with fully erupted teeth. Um, they're erupted, they're pretty fixed in their position. So the intermittent forces applied um, with that type of orthodontics don't seem to be sufficient or frequent enough to um, Um, actually impact um, the position of those teeth or create any movement Um, yeah theoretically orthodontic movement of these teeth is possible but I think they would need a really sustained sort of force for that to occur and we see the same thing in the permanent dentition I think that's something that we'll really sort of focus on next time is when um, to utilize ball therapy and when it's um, you know, I, uh, yeah, when you'd sort of um, look at it and when you wouldn't. Um, we will almost always discuss ball therapy at this point um, after deciduous extractions um, because we feel that getting the puppy into the habit of um, playing with the ball and having them ready to go if that treatment is appropriate for them is awesome. Um, but in our experience, yeah, in a fully erupted tooth, um, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to pop a I guess, apply sufficient or frequent enough force to actually um, actually get any movement at all. And I think that I think there may be some value in it, not from the ortho, I agree with Beck, not from the orthodontic approach. I don't, I agree. I don't believe it provides an, enough constant force to do much, but it may offer some degree of relief by having the dog have something in its mouth. If it's got that in there a lot of the time. So if they're not prepared to, I guess, go down the road of extractions, maybe it's a timing issue. You've, we've only caught it at four months and there's really, we're not really going to jump in with extraction now. Um, Get a jam something in its mouth. So whenever there is something between the tooth and the palate, great. This dog is, has got relief. Um, But, and as Beck said, it may be that we are going to be looking at it um, from a, from an actual treatment point of view at this around the five months, again, in webinar number two, um, and getting them used to this idea is going to be pay yeah. off uh, at that point in time. We find it has its maximal benefit um, at the time of eruption. So if you've got an erupting tooth that's actively moving through the bone, um, that's the time when short inter- intermittent forces such as those applied with ball therapy or even digital manipulation of the teeth, that's when they have their greatest benefit. Um, so that's when we would generally recommend they do that sort of thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I was just going to say, but I like this. We've got a few of them here, but I like this slide here. Um, we don't often do this. We don't look at um, these developing teeth, but I, I love looking at this this mandible here and seeing we've got crowns developed. So they are the, certainly the first part of a, any tooth that is developing. And so mm-hmm. this is why um, enamel damage is, is what we're mostly concerned about because 
what we also see here, they don't have any roots yet. So um, root damage is not something that we're really considering a big, big mm. issue. Um, but I guess if you really got in there and really drove your instrument down, you'd, you can still knock it around. Um, but we can see, and when we can contrast that against maybe some our adult um, dentition, particularly for five years plus, very different looking on x-ray. So these yeah, got gigantic right. bulbs. I think this also really highlights just how crowded a space we're dealing with and why you see damage to the permanent teeth. Like you're dealing with, if you're sneaking down the aspect, yeah. it's got to be near impossible to avoid um, that. So, and that's why we were, we sort of try and limit ourselves to that sort of dorsal ventral and, and yeah. buccal surface when we're trying to take these teeth out. And that's interesting as well, Beck, pointing that out. So we talked about before saying that incisors are sometimes involved. Yeah. You know, oh, well, why is it a canine? Exactly. And look where that deciduous tooth is, that deciduous canine. It's against the third. It's not, but yes, it's against the canine as well. Yeah, so that's but it there. It's right, yeah. It's right next to that third incisor as well. So, yeah, no wonder they get caught up in it. Okay. A lot of stuff going on in these little jaws. There definitely is. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Do you want to wrap it up or do you want to run through a few cases? How's everyone going with time? Because we got all night. Well, actually, I don't have all night. <laughs> <laughs> no questions just popped up. Um, no, cat, cats with malocclusions in general are uncommon. Mm. Um, I own one. You do. <laughs> my, latest cat, my latest kitten came through. <laughs> she, yeah, she actually has this. <laughs> so do I see it? I see it every day when she jumps on the bed. But um, no, it, it is it is uncommon. Um, thankfully, we haven't messed around with cats too much in no. with breeding. Um, so I think that's why we don't really see that. Um, I think a lot of the time we see it in cats, it's following trauma. Um, it's often not, you know, a primary malocclusion or developmental issue. Obviously, your brachy cats or your Persians and the likes of that will often see class threes or um, underbites. But this is, it's less commonly an issue where they'll have um, mandibular canines trapping. That said, we've probably seen half a dozen this year. Um, yeah. but it's, it's not particularly common. We would see potentially half a dozen dogs with this issue a week or more. Yeah. Yeah, half a dozen in a day. Some days, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah with variations of. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Oh, another one. Yep. Routine deciduous canines in cats, specific age. Look, um, I guess the question is, is there a specific age that we recommend removal um, of persistent deciduous teeth in cats? Um, no, not specifically. As soon as you see it, I would recommend intervention. I'm not one to sort of sit and watch and wait um, because in the vast majority of cases, um, you know, if it's still there when you see it and it's not sort of got that pinky purple tinge and there's no mobility yeah, to it's it. Not wobbling. Um, yeah, it's unlikely to um, resorb and fall out of its own accord. If we see it at the time that the dentition is still erupting, and I guess this is something we'll touch on again in the next one, um, that's more through that eruption period, but um, it has those teeth, if they are um, still present, have a real potential to impact the position of the permanent teeth. Generally, the deciduous tooth seems to be the one in the correct position and the permanent will then, um, I guess, with maxillary canine teeth, you may have um, realised will um, come to the realisation that the permanent tooth will almost always come down in front of the deciduous tooth. And with the mandibular canines, the permanent one will almost always come up lingual um, to the deciduous tooth. So if you have um, a tight bite or a pre-existing malocclusion, you'll often see it absolutely exacerbated by retention of those deciduous teeth. And because of that, we are not inclined to do the watch and wait. As soon as we yeah. notice it, we'll recommend intervention. And there's a lot of malocclusions that we see. If just the timing had been right, it's likely there'd be no problem for the patient yeah. if things would have sorted themselves out. And so it's something we, we're going to address, I guess, in the series in the next 
um, webinar where we get to that these transitioning mouths um, it is a big issue and there's a, an interesting question we do get actually asked this uh, from time to time um, the question is about um, whether deciduous canine extraction is it referral or is it um, reasonable to be performed by in GP practice absolutely do it in GP practice I think we all can develop those skills um, yeah. it, it takes time um, but no, it, it, this is not something that needs to come to us. No, I enjoy it and we're not going to, we don't turn them away. I, I actually do really enjoy it, but, um, no, I, I think if you're confident, um, yeah, go for it. And um, if you're not, there's, yeah, there's no problem in referral as well. That's the thing. Like if yep. it's something that for you, it's just not your thing, absolutely, um, offer referral, but you know, I think it's absolutely something that um, is in many vet skill set and they do it really, really well. Um, and I guess the take home as well is, you know, don't be completely disheartened if you do have a few that don't go quite to plan. Aaron and I have both had them happen to us as well and we will continue to as long as we continue to do dentistry. Um, it's just being aware of it. And if you do have that case that comes back, so that case that Aaron showed before the little dash down with that tiny little enamel spot that's my thing if I'm going to get damage I always get it on that one exact spot and I haven't quite figured out exactly what it is that um that causes that um but, yeah. Yeah, it must be <laughs> um but yeah, if you're, you're seeing that you've got um, that damage um, of incisors or the likes of that, yeah, think about your anatomy, think about how you're actually placing your instrument, what instruments you're using. Um, and yeah, if you've got that awareness, I think you'll find that there's always going to be improvement as well. So yeah, At the end of the day, stuff happens. So yeah. no one's perfect. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, again, still open for questions, guys, but I guess we'll sort of, we'll start winding it up. Thank you for attending. Um, yeah, yeah I've, en I've enjoyed listening um, to Beck. To me, why not again? <laughs> That's okay. We talk all day. We'll talk mm -hmm. all night. Um, this is good. And I, what we will be sending out after this, um, you should all receive an email uh, survey um, with this, just get, trying to get a bit of feedback, see... Um, where we, we can be going with this. Um, but of particular, to me, it's important. I, I'd like to hear some feedback about what kind of topics in the future you would like to cover. Um, but certainly the plan initially here is we do want to travel through, um, and we've, we've covered off in these juvenile mouths, these young uh, six to 12 weeks dogs, uh, and possibly cats, but mostly dogs, uh, six to 12 weeks. And we're going to follow them through now as they shed their den, den, uh, deciduous. <laughs> shed their deciduous teeth and move into a permanent mouth. Uh, and if they still have these, these occlusal problems, we'll follow them through until we fix them. Uh, so there's certainly at least another two uh, webinars in this yeah, uh, absolutely. series. And I guess um, we really want to try and focus on things that you guys can do and giving you the tools to be able to really confidently discuss this with clients as well. It's not all what we do. Um, we want, there'll be a little bit of discussion of it, I guess, so you have a greater awareness of it and can in some ways prime clients for it. But we really want to keep trying to bring it back to, um, I guess, I get the things that maybe I wished I was a little bit better at in general practice or I knew a little bit more about as well um, and just things we've learned along the way that might be a bit helpful. Yeah, um, I'm just typing here. Thank you to everyone that's offering up there. Thanks. Um, actually, speaking to um, your question before, Danielle, about whether it's referral or GP thing, uh, I think you'll find we're, we're pretty practically minded people, I think, and we do want to put these these skills and knowledge in your hands so you can be doing it in practice. There's there's very few things that that I think we do that is peculiar to us, um, but they will take time and, and knowledge, and yeah, so that's that's what we hope to provide. Um, just get you a bit more confident in doing these things. For sure. Yeah. Well, cool. um, I think we might wrap it up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah guys. Thank you, everyone. And um, I guess 
hoping to have the next one in the next couple of weeks. I think that we'll send out a little bit of um, like a survey for some feedback. So let us know on timing as well. Um, we're just going to offer up a few different times to see what works best for people. And also, I guess, how frequently these things might be useful to you guys, because we'd want to continue on beyond this um, series and just make it a regular sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yes, um, um, for everyone that came in late, we have got a recording of it and we'll make that available as well. Um, we do have to work out how to do it first, but it has been recorded <laughs> as far as we know. <laughs> Our practice one did the other night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. All right, guys, yeah, um, I guess that's us signing off. Have yeah. a good night. Have a good Friday. Hopefully we mm -hmm. all... The, for those of that are still in, in lockdown, we're out of that on Sunday. That would be lovely. Uh, yeah. For those that aren't, enjoy. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, we're always actually flip up the last screen back. I think my, I think most of you've got obviously our details. It'll be on the emails that you've received for this anyway. Um, but yeah, look, feel free to throw throw questions our way via email. That's that's the easiest to get us. At. Um, we are pretty busy, so we're not always available uh, on the phone. Um, but yeah, throw throw pictures, x-rays, everything you've got at us and yeah, we'll get back to you where we can. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and help you out. Yeah. Alrighty. Good night, guys. Yeah, good night, everybody. Thank you.